Let me record this. Yeah, cool. Okay, I'm going to share the screen and just uh, sort of scribble things down. Um, so, you know, first of all, just in terms of currency notation, um, you might have seen, you know, like you, you, you can sort of have something like euro dollar or dollar euro. Yeah, there's two different ways you can quote something. Um, now, in academia, people tend to quote dollar euro, but in markets, everything's quoted euro dollar. And they, they meet kind of almost mean the same thing, but it's just quoted differently. So in markets, which is what we care about, everything is quote, if we say euro dollar, that means how many dollars can you buy per euro? You know, so if it's like 120, that means, you know, uh, one dollar 20 per, per euro. Um, if, you, if you were to write it this way, dollar euro in market terms, that would be the reciprocal of that. Um, so that would be uh, 0.833. Um, that would be 0 0.83 euros per per dollar. Yeah. So that's that's kind of the first thing to note. Okay. So the first thing that's mentioned this bit is the the base, the denominator. Um, now the currency conventions. They're very specific things. Uh, um, in markets, uh, if the euro is involved, the euro is always the base currency. So if you have um, uh, the dollar or the euro, uh, uh, if, if you have, say, for example, the Australian dollar, um, would you, is a market convention, is it to quote it like, uh, actually, let me not do Aussie, let me do like Swiss franc. Is the convention to do it Swiss Euro or is it Euro Swiss? You know, there's two different ways you could do that for, for say Swiss franc. Um, and the answer is Euro always takes precedence. So Euro is always the base currency. Um, that's also true with Sterling. Sterling's always the base currency, unless you have the Euro. <laughs> Sterling is the base currency, unless, unless you have the Euro. So, so, you know, in, in, the, in the financial, in, in the press, like if you read the Times or something, uh, they often say uh, sterling euro. That's how they quote it, which is, you know, and that turns out to be um, uh, like one over 0.9 at the moment. So that's like 111. That's how people uh, on the street in the UK think about uh, sterling euro. But in markets, we quote it euro sterling, which is at the moment, it's about 0.9. So sterling is the base currency unless euro. Um, and there's other, there's two other currencies which are base currencies. That's Australian dollar and New Zealand dollar are also the base currencies as well. So uh, with Aussie, if you have the dollar, it's Aussie dollar and you have Kiwi dollar. So key, Aussie and Kiwi are, are the base currencies, uh, base currencies uh, against the dollar. So, Every other currency, uh, euro is always the base currency, is always the base currency. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, the dollar is the base currency. So, for example, if you have uh, Canada, that's dollar CAD. If you have uh, Sweden, that's dollar stocky. If you have Norway, if you have Brazil, uh, and so on. Um, now, suddenly, if you have uh, Euro Brazil, then that's Euro Brazil like that, and so on. So, so is that clear? Okay, so that that's kind of the first point. Just understanding the conventions of. of, so, of so, sorry, which one takes precedence if it's uh, Aussie dollar versus New Zealand dollar? Is it? Uh, uh, it's Aussie. So Aussie. yeah. So so um, yeah. It's a good question, and it's. Aussie Kiwi, Aussie Kiwi. Okay, so these are kind of quote, quote, uh, quoting conventions. Uh, and then the other thing is um, uh, nicknames, nicknames for the currencies. So with sterling, it's uh, sterling, uh, or it's a cable. A cable if it's versus the US dollar. So, uh, and that's to do that. The reason it's called cable 
um, is because there's a transatlantic cable between the US and uh, UK, and that's for some reason got called that. Uh, Euro, Euro is just uh, Euro. Um, Swiss franc um, is a Swissy. Uh, Swedish krona, uh, let me actually write that then. So Swedish krona, uh, Swedish krona is uh, stocky. I, I don't know why, but stocky. And uh, Norwegian krona, uh, Norwegian krona is noki. Uh, and then you have uh, the Australian dollar, that's Aussie. Uh, uh, Kiwi, which is the New, New Zealand dollar. Uh, New Zealand, uh, I'll, I'll send you the spreadsheet actually, uh, is the Kiwi because that's a picture of a kiwi on the note there. Um, the Japanese yen is just the yen. Uh, so Japanese yen is just the yen. Uh, China is interesting, uh, CNI. So that's the Chinese yuan, but uh, the, it can also be called the renminbi. And actually Angela can probably explain this better, but renminbi is the name of the currency and yuan is like um, dollar. Uh, it's, like, it's like the Chinese version of the dollar you know, rather than US dollar, renminbi is the name of the currency. So people, it's interchangeable, renminbi or yuan um, is kind of the two terms you can use for it. Um, so renminbi means uh, people's money. Yeah, people's money, yeah, yeah. And then yuan is just a unit, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, any other currencies? Uh, also, can we, uh, let me think. Uh, Mexican peso, Brazil. Uh, I think the all, most of the other currencies just are the are the name of the currency, as you would expect it. Uh, yeah. So these are kind of some of the nicknames. Um, so that's an that's kind of uh, quoting conventions. Um, is there uh, any nickname for the Canadian dollar? Oh yeah, there is, there is. Although people don't use it too much, but um, yeah, the Canadian dollar, so that's Canadian, it's known as the loony, <laughs> which is the name of the bird. Apparently it's the name of the bird, but it, it's not, not everyone uses that. You know, uh, loony in the UK is, is a slang term for somebody who has got mental health problems. So, uh, you know, the, the loony bin and stuff like that, but that's the nickname for the Canadian dollar, loony. Um, uh, so that's that's uh, the name for that. Um, now, in terms of sort of the f you know FX or finance, you know sort of financial aspect of it, when you uh, when you buy a currency um, in 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 the FX markets, the way things work are, uh, let's say you uh, let's pick a currency which does have. Uh, some big interest rate differential. So let, let's say you have a, a currency like dollar Mexico. Yeah. So when you, as an investor, uh, what you're always doing is that you, when you, when you invest in Mexican peso, what you're doing uh, as investor, okay. Say you you are long Mexic Mex versus the dollar, so that that's a position you have on. So you you're, you you want the Mexican peso to appreciate against the U.S. dollar. Now the first thing to note is that uh, the Mexican peso say it's around twenty. Um, so one U.S. dollar buys twenty Mexican peso. In order for you to make money, this number has to go down. So if it goes to fifteen. You, you've made a profit off, you know, uh, you've made a profit off, well, it's gone down 25, but you've made the opposite of that. You've made 25% profit. Yeah. So, so one of the confusing things about currencies are you say I'm long Mexico, um, but what you want is you want dollar Mexico to go down. So it's a bit in your head, it kind of gets a bit confusing because you want, you're saying the currency is going up but the currency is going to go, the quoted currency goes down. So you have to be very careful with language when you say, you know, I'm long Mexico. I expect Mexico to appreciate. Um, and as a result, I, you know, dollar Mex fell. So, you know, when you say Mexico rallied, 
that is the same as dollar Mexico falling. Yeah. So it's it's a bit you have to be careful when you when you sort of talk about these things in, in your notes. You know, you're saying, okay, um, you know, Mexico's had a great month, dollar Mexico fell. You know, so you just have to sort of be clear with the language there. If you say dollar Mexico rose, what you're saying is Mexican peso weakened. So you can't say Mexico rallied. Um, so so that's that's kind of one thing, one thing to note. Then the other thing is about how interest rates, uh, how interest rates relate, uh, interest rates uh, relate to FX, which is very important, because when you go long Mexico, you're earning Mexican interest rates, um, and the way you fund that, so you need that money from somewhere. The way you fund that is you're borrowing in dollars, so FX is is always a long short market. You you never have like some cash that you're going to uh, bureau de change and changing. And that's not how it works. The way it works is you, you borrow, you, you borrow in, in us dollars and you uh, invest in Mexico. That's it, effectively what you're doing when you're long Mexican peso against the us dollar, which from a trading perspective, the language you use is you say you're short dollar max. So short means borrowed. You're you're short. You're short of it. Uh, so you're you're borrowing uh, U.S. dollars and you're buying or you're investing in Mexican peso. And what is the interest that you're earning? It's short-term interest rates. So you know it can be, for example, the overnight interest rates. So if I look at the overnight interest rates in uh, so this is just a, a table here that shows you overnight rates in uh, in the US. So at the moment, uh, these are like T-bills. So let's say that's used as a proxy. This is, it's uh, 0.07%. So seven basis points is how much it costs to borrow. Uh, so that's, so the US dollar overnight uh, current is 0.07%. And then if we do the same for Mexico, so Mexico is here. So let's look at short-term rates there. So short-term rates, uh, the, this is kind of like the two month, which is fine, is 4.3%, uh, 4.3%. Now, when it says um, overnight rate, this is the annualized overnight rate. Um, so, so if you were to go short dollar Mexico, what's happening is that you are you are going to earn four point three percent, and you have to pay 007 percent, so and that's the interest rate differential. And and the name for that in markets is called carry. So your 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 positive carry. You have a carry trade. So if you were to hold that position for one whole year, you would earn four point two three percent. So what that means is that uh, you you are short dollar Mexico for one year, and uh, over that period, over that period you will earn 4.23% in carry. So that means that if dollar Mexico goes sideways, uh, so if dollar Mexico stays at stays at 20, you 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 have made uh, you have uh, you have made 4.23% uh, return. So in, in currency markets, even if the currency doesn't move, you can still make money because there's two returns of a currency. So FX return is equal to the spot change uh, plus the carry. That's the, the return in FX markets. Um, so you always have to remember that as an investor, you have to take into account the interest as well. Um, and this is closely related to the, uh, the concept of forwards. So in FX markets, you have a forward curve. So if we look at dollar Mexico, uh, you have spot uh, and let, let's say, and then we have forwards. So the, let's say the one month forward 
we'll look at the three month forward and the 12 month forward. So forwards are simply an agreement to buy or sell the currency um, at a future date. So an option is the option to, a forward is you have to exchange at that exchange rate. Um, now, how is the forward derived? Um, you know, there's a, there's a market forward rate. So if we look at Mexico, um, uh, what's the FRD, uh, FRD? Okay, let's, let's do that. Okay, so this is dollar Mexico. So what you see here is, uh, let me just see if they can just show the midpoints. Uh, okay, forget about that. Okay, so currently spot uh, overnight, that spot is at 19.7. Forget about the ask, we just look at the bid. Uh, so the spot at the moment is 19.71. 19 uh, now the three month forward, three months here is 19.89. 19 point, oh, hang on, I, uh, let me do the one month first. Okay, the one month is 19.77. The three month is 19.89. And the one year is 20.52, 20.52. So what you notice is it's going up First of all, so you know if you look at this, it's 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 uh, it's going up. Um, it, there's a kink there because I didn't have six months, so there's a, the it's it's a longer gap. It's nine month gap there, two month gap, one month. So that's why it jumps. Although it should be a smooth curve. So let me ask you guys, why 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 is the forwards going up? Is the market expecting a depreciation? Uh, yep, yep. So the market is expecting depreciation, and but why? Why is that? Why is it expecting a depreciation? Market is short uh, Mexican pesos and long U.S. dollar. Um. Okay. Uh. But when you say market is short, that's who in the market is because it, you know everything gets netted out. If somebody's short Mexico. Somebody else must be long Mexico. Like which, which side, you know, because if I'm an investor, I bought Mexico, say, you know, and I bought it from somebody else. So they sold it to me. They're short Mexico. I'm long Mexico. So, you know, we both have the opposite position. Well, this is just incorporating the carry that you would earn over um, over the current rate. And yeah. whatever the difference is, is kind of, I guess it's a, it's the market, the market expectations for yeah. It, yeah, exactly. So that that's that's uh, so this relates to the concept called um, in in economic theory you call this covered interest rate parity, which is this idea that there's a which is to do with arbitrage. So there has to be no arbitrage. Uh, arbitrage basically means there can't be a risk-free way of making money in markets. Markets will have to adjust to make sure there's no arbitrage. So the way this works is that if if I um, if I bought uh, if if I uh, bought the uh, twelve month forward, um, so so basically what this argues is that the forward is equal to spot plus the carry, yeah. So r roughly speaking, um, or actually more more accurately, it's the forward minus the carry. Um, so, so the way this works is that if, if, I, um, if I bought spot, so if I bought spot at 19.71, and then I sold, sold a forward, uh, sold a forward at 20.52, um, uh, you know, I would make, you know, the, a return there, you know, the, which is the carry basically. Um, uh, so, so I'd, I'd make whatever that is, that's 4.223% uh, if, if you do that. So you, 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 you bought dollars of that and you sold it at 4.23. Um, what, what I can do is that, um, 
um, but the the but the issue here is um, actually no no let me do it the other way around. Let me tell you if if I if um, no the return sorry the return isn't four point two three percent. It's actually zero. Um, it's it's zero because of the carry. Uh, so is equal to zero total return. Um, whereas if you, let's say you bought spot at 19.73 and you and if the forwards were lower so let's say the forwards were unchanged at 19.71 what would happen there is that you would um because i bought mm -hmm. yeah because i bought dollars uh actually let me do it the other way around because it's it's to do with the carry sell and then i buy a forward Uh, so if I sell spot and, and buy the forward, um, uh, what, uh, actually, let me, let me ignore that one. So let, let's, let's, let's kind of pick an example. So let's say I sold a dollar Mexico, um, and, uh, at 19.71 and then at the same time, uh, let's say I could uh, buy the forward at 19.71 in, in 12 months. What happens there is I've, I've got rid of the currency risk because I'm, I'm long the currency. I'm, I'm short the currency and I'm long the currency. So I'm short and long, so the currency risk is gone. If the currency moves up and down, it doesn't matter. Uh, but what, what's happened there is I've locked in 4.23% which is the carry, you know? So, so basically here I am uh, long Mexico, my exposure, and here I'm short Mexico. This is your exposure. Uh, and if the spot is equal to the forward, then, then you, you, uh, you capture the carry without without any FX risk. Yeah. So 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 Vlad, going back to what you were saying, you know, so what what happens in in markets is that you know because there's this arbitrage, what happens is everybody will be doing this, and so what happens is you short Mexico, people will continually do this because there's an arbitrage condition here until this forward price gets to the point where you can't make the guaranteed carry anymore. Yeah. Yep. So the forward, the 12 month forward has to increase until there is no guaranteed risk-free carry. Therefore, the forwards equal are equal to the carry over any point in time. So um, Mexico has higher interest rates than the US. That means uh, there's positive carry for long Mexico. That means the Mexican peso has to weaken in 12 months by the amount that you'd earn uh, carry in. So positive carry currencies will always have forwards, which will show that they're gonna weaken Whereas low interest rate currencies will always have forwards that show that they will strengthen to make up for the fact that you lose money by low, going along that currency. Um, so is, is, is that clear? A quick question. So um, does that mean that, um, so the forward curve is just locked in by the spot and the, um, and the carry that there's yeah. no kind of expectation um, that's reflected in that? Yeah, yeah. So that, that's that's the twist here that people kind of think, okay, forwards reflects market expectations. It doesn't. It just reflects the interest rate differential. That's all it does. And does it is it just the short term interest rate or it goes up the yield curve? It's the forward will always be uh, reflective of the interest rate for that period. So if you look at three month forwards, you look at three month interest rates. Okay. If you've got 12 month forwards, you've got 12 month interest rates. If you look at five year forwards, you've got five year interest rates. So if the curve's steep, you know, the interest rate will be higher. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. Yeah. Good. Vlad, is that clear? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying still to get like, why is it long Mexico and then it's sold US dollars uh, versus Mexico? Um, oh, yeah, because this goes back to the quoting, uh, the, the the quoting kind of thing that uh, when you're long Mexico, the currency quotation is dollar Mexico. So if you want to buy Mexico, you have to sell dollar mexico yeah. you, you sell the first currency in the quotation so uh so if you if i if i say buy dollar mexico that's that means i am buying us dollars and i am selling mexican peso so if i buy and long is the same thing um and then if I say I'm selling or short dollar Mexico, that means I am selling US dollars and buying Mexican pesos, buying Mexican peso. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So when we go back down here, cause I sold dollar Mexico. So I'm, I'm selling the first thing in the quotation, which is dollars. Yeah. If I'm selling that, that must mean I'm buying the second part of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it makes sense now. Yeah. Sam, yeah. Yeah, sorry. So um if if you if you take this strategy, so if you're using forwards and you're you're um you're not trying to take on any FX risk, does that mean you're taking a position on a country's interest rates? So here you would get a higher return if um, the interest rate differential changes between the US and Mexico. So that 4.23% uh, would increase if um, the gap between the US and Mexico increases. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, what you're doing there is you're taking a view now on the interest rate differential between the two countries. So if the rate differential narrows or increases, then your, your PL will change. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. But it doesn't matter what the FX is doing. Yeah. Know. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks. Okay. And now, now just to make things even more confusing, uh, <laughs> there's something called uncovered interest rate parity. Um, So the, why it's interest rate parity, what that means is that um, when you have interest, there has to be parity in the sense that if you have interest rate differential, the FX has to, new, you know, has to cancel out. There has to kind of make things par, you know, back, back to the same parity. It's called covered because you're doing two transactions, two offsetting currency transactions. You're you're buying the forward and you're selling spot. So it's covered, your forward is covered. So, so you, you have your forward, but you've covered it with an underlying spot transaction. So you remove the risk in the underlying market. So there's no FX risk anymore. Now uncovered uh, means that you don't buy the spot. You, you just buy the forward, yeah? Uh, uncovered means uh, just buying or selling the forwards. So what this says is uh, that um, uh, this is essentially in, uh, uh, another way of saying that if you now say, okay, I will always buy Mexico because there's high interest rates than the dollar. So I will just buy Mexico. Uh, I expose myself. Uh, you just buy yourself or uh, no cover so no spot so you you are exposed to the fx risk as well as earning the carry yeah so now you you buy you buy 12 month forwarding mexican uh, peso um so you're gonna so in this case you you sell the 12 month forward you're selling because you want to get you you want to be um you sell the you sell at 20.52. And what you want is as long as spot is below 20.52 in 12 months time, 
you'll make a profit. Yeah. So if if spot is is below nineteen point seven one in twelve months, you have made money. Now, now the the question is, um, if you do this strategy systematically over time, um, is this a way you can always make money or not? Now, in theory, uh, in theory, uh, in theory, uncovered UIP, which is uncovered interest rate parity, is not supposed to make money. In theory, UIP. Uh, Argues, argues that over time, the FX moves, FX will move in a way, uh, in a way that will wipe out your carry gains, uh, wipe out your 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 carry carry gains. So the theory basically says that um, when you have a when you're trying to trade this carry trade, what should happen is that so many people will do this that the opportunity to make the currency, to make gains will go away because everybody will be doing this. So in theory, what happens, um, now, now this is, is, is kind of linked to the arbitrage. Now th this, this is a true risk-free because you, you don't have any FX risk. You have a spot transaction and forward that cancel each other out. So there's no FX risk. Uh, now this is not technically an arbitrage because you you are taking a risk. You know you're 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 making a bet on Mexico going up or down. But theoretically, what should happen is that instantaneously, uh, an infinite amount of money should come into buying Mexico, which will cause the Mexican peso to um, to uh, to strengthen massively so that by the time you get into the trade it will start to weaken uh you know as as you go into the trade so that that's kind of the theory um in practice uh in theory uh wipe out the game as as an infinite infinite sort of amount of of capital uh, causes an, uh, an instant jump in jump in Mexican peso, which which then weakens over time to wipe out the carry to wipe out the carry. Now, um, in reality, in reality, a UIP does not hold, and there's something called uh, forward rate bias exists. Forward forward rate bias exists. Um, that means there's a bias in this for some reason, which is another way of saying that carry trades work. Carry trades work, which means that if you, if you systematically, systematically buy high interest rate currencies, currencies, uh, you do make return positive returns over time. Yeah. So basically, if you were to do this strategy of buying Mexico and selling the dollar, in theory, that shouldn't really work because an implement of capital wipes out that opportunity. In practice, the Mexican pace, it doesn't weaken enough each time. It, it, it's always a bit stronger than it should be, and you do make money over time. In fact, the academic literature shows that if anything, um, often you get gains on the currency. So the theory is is not just marginally wrong; it's massively wrong. You know, so so in in general, if anything, the currency actually goes up in your favor on top of the carry. Um, uh, now, in markets, we know why that is. The reason we know why you can make money from carry trades is that they uh, exact exhibit large drawdowns. So what happens with carry trades are that you make money every day, small amount of money every day through the carry. Then what happens is you, at one point in the year, you have a massive loss, you know, it falls 10%. And because of that, um, uh, in markets, people view that as your, 
uh, by by being long carry trade, you're exposing yourself to bad tail risk. You're 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 basically going long a strategy, which uh, has a high level of risk, which you're being compensated for. So in markets, people say that you collect the pennies before the steamroller, and if you carry on collecting pennies too much, the steamroller is going to run you over. And there's other jargon people use. You know, you go up the lift or the elevator. You slowly go up the lift and elevator, but you fall down the elevator shaft. So then you, you know, as if the elevator disappears and you fall down the, you know, the the thing. So um, so that that's kind of the way um, it, it it kind of works um, in in markets. People view the positive return as compensation for large sudden drawdowns. So is, is that clear, everyone? Yes. OK, cool. So I'll give you an example of the most famous carry trade of all time, which happened in the 1990s. So carry trade is a strategy where you buy the high interest rate currency and you sell the low interest rate currency. So um, let me do over. So let's do it from 1995. So actually, no, maybe do a bit earlier. So, so this is dollar yen. So this is the US dollar against the Japanese yen. Now, what you can see is from 1990 until 1995, the dollar fell um, against the Japanese yen. So it was a massive decline. Um, the reason for this was that in the 1980s, Japan had the bubble economy. You know, Jap the Japanese economy was doing fantastically well, and essentially Japan bought up the rest of the world. You know, it, it bought up Hollywood and it bought up all these expensive apartments in New York and so on. Uh, the economy collapsed, so the Japanese brought all their money home, and that led to this massive appreciation. So that repatriation led to the Japanese yen strengthening. However, um, at the same time, Japan was going through a banking crisis, and its interest rates started to fall quite sharply because they had to cut rates. Um, they had to cut interest rates. Yeah, so this is Japanese interest rates. So they were, in, in 1990, Jap Japan had 8% interest rates. But as the economy was weakening, they kept cutting uh, interest rates, the yellow line. Um, and by the mid-1990s, they had cut interest rates to almost zero. So what we talk about zero rates everywhere today, Japan went through this about 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And so what happened here was, uh, and, and this, this big drop here in dollar yen was Japan had an earthquake and they repatriated money around that time. But when Japan's interest rate went to zero, everybody said, uh, actually, let me show you US interest rates at the same time as well. Uh, So these are U.S. interest rates, the the green line. So you can see, you know, there, there was a world, there was a recession in the 1990s. Everybody was cutting interest rates, but uh, by the mid 1990s, the U.S. was doing really, really well. This was the beginning of the dot com boom in the U.S. All the tech companies started to do well. The U.S. started to hike rates. You know, it went up to uh, around six percent. Japan was cutting rates because Japan was just in a mess. Um, so you see this massive differential. So this is the two biggest currencies in the world, uh, the dollar and the yen. In the US, you could earn 6%, five and a half, six percent if you bought the US dollar. And in Japan, you could basically borrow at zero. So what every investor in the world did was they borrowed Japanese yen and they bought the dollar. So they bought the dollar yen carry trade. So this is the famous dollar yen carry trade. So what happened was, dollar yen was going up over that time. So not only were you earning the carry, the dollar was going up. So this was amazing returns. So everybody thought this was fantastic. More and more people went into it. Then we got hit by the Asia crisis. This was when Asia went through a series of defaults, starting from Thailand, uh, and it went through Malaysia and other countries, and dollar yen collapsed all of a sudden. Now, Asia crisis had nothing to do with Japan. Yeah, what happened was investors had to liquidate, had to sell all the Asia positions, and they ended up selling their yen positions as well, uh, buying their yen back. Dollar yen collapsed. Not to worry, you know, people went back into the trade. It started to go back all the way up again. 
And then in 1998, what happened was that Russia defaulted. Uh, and at the time, uh, there was a hedge fund called LTCM, uh, which was a famous one run by all these Nobel laureates who basically were buying Russian bonds. They were doing lots of carry trades in multiple markets. They bought Dolly N, they were long Russia, they were long all of these other types of carry trades in different markets. They had huge exposure. Russia defaulted, they had to unwind that position, that led to margin calls, and they had to unwind all their other positions as well. And then what happened was Dolly N collapsed. So in the space of, if you can see, look, the rise here, this took about two, three years to get to that point. And in the space of um, a few weeks or a few days, it went down that much. If I zoom in to this point here, this is the space of two, three days. Dolly N fell, in, in the space of two or three days, it fell 15% in two or three days. And, and if you kind of zoom out again, so 15% in two or three days, which is, it took mm -hmm. two, three years to gain 15%. You lost it in two, three days. Um, and then Dolly and Kachi carried on falling thereafter, you know, for a few other reasons as well. But this is the this is the archetypal carry trade, and this is what the risks are that uh, you get these sudden massive drops, and that's why you know the carry trade is actually quite dangerous. You have to be very careful with it. And normally, what happens is people enter the carry trade towards the end. You know, so most of the money is usually at this point. It's not. It's not at this point. And so all the money comes in here. That's why when it drops, it's very sudden because everybody has to unwind their positions. Mm. Um, you have the same phenomenon in equity markets as well. So in equities, you know, like this uh, during the COVID period, massive drop, and then it bounces back. This is the FX version of, of that. So, so any, uh, any questions? Um, so has the, the behavior of these drops in carry trades, have they changed at all um, in, recent, in the recent decade or the kind of the dynamics are quite the same? Um, it's, it's similar. Um, the issue today is that the interest rate differentials are much, much smaller. So the size of the carry trades is much smaller. You know, everyone's gone to zero, so you don't see as much of it as before, but you still do see it. So for example, Turkey, at the moment, Turkey has the highest interest rates in the world. And so this is Turkey over the last five years. Uh, so, uh, so when this is going up, that means it's, it's weakening. Uh, so, so basically, you know, say in 2019, people were selling dollars buying Turkey. So what they wanted was they wanted dollar Turkey to go down. So they didn't want it to go up because it will wipe out your carry. So mm -hmm. over 2019, people were doing, making lots of money being long Turkey. Then during COVID, it blew up in their face. Um, that was a carry on wind, a drawdown, very rapid one. Then start to make money again here, and then another rapid decline as well. So you, you do still see it today, but it often happens more in the emerging markets now because that's where the carry is. So that's, um, uh, yeah, so I'll stop sharing there. So, so that's basically a whirlwind tour of FX. And um, yeah, no, thanks. Uh, I, I've I've done um, in in economic class. Obviously, you do a lot of UIP and, and uh, CIP. But uh, when you know, when you see it in numbers and you discuss it like that, it's it's so much more intuitive. Yeah. Um, especially looking at the difference between CIP and UIP there. Um, yeah. Yeah. I hadn't realized how you use forwards actually to, uh, use spots uh, to cover your risk. Um, yeah. I yeah. And visualized it like that before which yeah. is pretty cool.